you doing? I'm Joe. Today, I continue my series of Harry Potter reviews leading up to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Today, we continue it with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And to give you guys some heads up, I'm probably not going to be able to finish this series of reviews before I see Fantastic Beasts. I'm probably going to see it at some point this week, considering that it's Thanksgiving coming up pretty soon. And uh, I don't know if the movie theater is going to be open so I can see it, but I promise you I am going to complete the series nonetheless. Definitely going to complete it by the end of the year, so there's that. And sorry that I've been a little bit slow lately with some of the videos because a lot of personal stuff's been going on. If you see my Facebook page or my Instagram, you probably know what it is, but I don't want to be too specific. Thank you guys for sticking around. You guys just seem to be really loving my thoughts on the Harry Potter movies, so I'm having a good time watching them again. Also, like with the others, there's going to be some spoilers, but also there might be some cursing in here. Not like a whole ton, but in regards to Dolores Umbridge, there's going to be an F-bomb or two. I'm just putting it out there and maybe a couple of profane words, but don't worry, I won't go overboard with it. So let's talk about Order of the Phoenix. Watching this movie last night, I have to say, as far as rewatches go, this might be the second best Harry Potter movie behind Prisoner of Azkaban as of rewatch. I mean, for a while, Deathly Hallows Part Two was my favorite. As of right now, this is my second favorite. Who knows, it might change when I see Deathly Hallows Part Two, but we'll see. The movie picks up right at the end of the summertime after all the events of Goblet of Fire. It opens up very quiet quietly, and almost in a dreamlike kind of state. It kind of reminded me of Terminator 2 when Sarah Connor has that dream of the nuclear bomb going off. You could tell that it's a dreamlike sequence, even though in this case, Harry's off in another world somewhere, thinking about what's going to happen in the future, what's happened before. And he also gets antagonized by Dudley and his cohorts, which were mentioned in the books, but in the movies they hadn't been mentioned before. And of course, Dudley antagonizes Harry by bringing up Cedric and Harry's mom, and everyone else is laughing, and Harry finally snaps pulls out his wand and puts it right at Dudley's chin. What I like about the scene is that even though Dudley's friends are laughing because they look at this thing and they go, it's a stick, what's he doing with a stick? Dudley on the other hand, he's not laughing. He knows what that thing can do. But all of a sudden, two Dementors appear and chase down Dudley and Harry into this tunnel under this uh, roadway. And Harry is forced to use a Patronus charm right in front of Dudley, using a Patronus charm in the presence of a muggle. And he's also under the age of 17. He's not allowed to use magic outside of school. And therefore, he receives a letter saying that he's being expelled from school. And after that, Professor Moody and some other people from the Ministry of Magic show up to take him to the Order of the Phoenix, which was formed back in the day when Voldemort brought up his army to attack the Wizarding World. And Harry meets up with Ron, Hermione, and the rest of Ron's family, and even Sirius Black shows up again, and along with Lupin. And they tell Harry about something that Voldemort is looking for this time around, something that he didn't have the last time. Now, I mentioned earlier that this movie opens in a very quiet and dreamlike kind of way. The director this time is David Yates, who went on to direct the next couple of Harry Potter movies right up to Deathly Hallows Part Two, and he's even doing Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. So, obviously, Warner Brothers likes this guy. He does an excellent job with almost every single one of these last couple movies. We'll get to Half Blood Prince later on, but this is probably one of his best made movies as far as in the franchise goes. This along with the script by Michael Goldenberg, they do a really good job of setting up all this tension between Harry and Umbridge and some of the other characters like Seamus and a few other people who think that Harry's basically a big nutcase for saying that Voldemort's back. And particularly in this pretty tense scene when Seamus basically calls Harry a liar. Don't you dare talk about my mother like that. I'll anyone that calls me a liar. And that's not even including the Minister of Magic Cornelius Fudge, who's too afraid to face the truth, especially in the court scene when he goes, he's not back. And the look on Dumbledore's face when he says that, it's like, you idiot. So therefore, Harry's put on trial, and eventually he's cleared of these charges, thanks to the great defense set up by Albus Dumbledore, which he could actually have been a lawyer. Hey, there's something to think about. But Dumbledore in this movie is notably very distant from Harry. Every time Harry tries to talk to him, Dumbledore just gives him the cold shoulder. And we later on know, at the end of the movie, we know now why that's the case. But it also shows you just how alone Harry really feels here. Almost everybody around him thinks that he's a nutcase because of what he saw. And Dumbledore is very distant from him, and the weight of the world is just piling even further onto his shoulders. He feels like nothing is going right for him. And even Ron and Hermione, as much as they're supporting him and everything, one thing I noticed is that they, for a while, seem a little bit oblivious to the fact that Voldemort Voldemort is actually back, and that they don't entirely understand what Harry went through in that graveyard in Goblet of Fire. Now, let's talk about Dolores Umbridge. If you thought Malfoy and his father were terrible, if you thought the Dursleys were terrible, 
I forgot how much I hate Umbridge. What a horrible, horrible person. But any words I say is not gonna cover it, so Tom, take it away. Evil, rotten, miserable, rotten fucking bitch. Couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> oh man. I'm sorry guys, I, I can't help myself. She is on assignment from the Ministry of Magic, trying to control every single aspect of what Hogwarts is doing, making up all these absurd rules, and it just keeps going up and up and up. And there's even a case when Harry gets in trouble and he has to write this sentence like, I don't know how many times, I must not tell lies or something. As he's writing it, it's scratched and imprinted onto his other hand. Worst person ever. Uh, and the line she says, you know you deserve to be punished. Done, I'm done. I'm done. And this goes on for a little while, but Hermione decides that they need to form an army in order to fight back since they're not going to get any help from Hogwarts. So the trio decide to start their own army called Dumbledore's Army by recruiting almost anyone who's willing to help Harry fight back. And this is probably one of my favorite scenes in the entire franchise because in this scene, almost everyone's looking at Harry saying, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just some nutcase. But then they also learn about Harry's use of the Patronus charm on the lake, fighting the Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets. Harry comes up and tells them, look, it sounds great when you talk about it, but half the time I didn't know what I was doing. What he says right after they talk about that stuff, the difference between school and actually looking at death in the face, you can feel the pain and torment in Harry's voice. You can see it in the look in his eyes. He's trying to get it through other people's heads that this is serious. And then it leads to another sequence of him training the other kids for Dumbledore's army, which is a very inspirational scene, especially when he talks about how the other wizards throughout history started out as students just like they did. And he teaches them about certain spells like Stupefy or the Patronus Charm and teaching Neville how to use Expelliarmus. And when he finally gets it, it's like, yes! And speaking of Neville, I mentioned in my Goblet of Fire review how he was very troubled by the Cruciatus Curse done by Mad-Eye Moody or Barty Crouch Jr. in disguise. In this movie, we learn that his parents had that same thing happen to them when he was younger by a certain Death Eater, Bellatrix Lestrange, played by Helena Bonham Carter, who is just absolutely insane and played very well by Carter, I might add. For a while, Neville was just kind of like the loser of the class who lived with his grandma. At least that's how I saw it when I, as I was watching these movies as they came out. But then you learn about his parents and all that stuff, and you really feel for Neville in this one. Oh, and I also hadn't brought this up yet, but there's this new character in here called Luna Lovegood. She is so bizarre, but yet... <laughs> <laughs> Hermione kind of said it best, Looney Lovegood. <laughs> she is really, really fascinating as a person. You're just as sane as I am. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but she's a lot of fun. And every time she's on screen, I can't help myself. I start laughing because the way she delivers her lines and the look in her face, I don't know how many times I did these scenes without somebody laughing at least one time because... She's that good. And that's another layer of humor that they add to this franchise. All the movies up until this point have been really good with humor in my eyes. Luna Lovegood just makes it even better. And of course, Ron is funny as always. Because I look like a bloody idiot, that's why. Do you ever stop eating? What? I'm hungry. And of course, Snape being asked by Umbridge about him trying to get the job of dark arts. You unsuccessful? Obviously. Now, since I mentioned Snape, let's talk about Harry's struggle with seeing certain things in his head. He starts to experience certain visions, like Ron's dad getting attacked by a snake, seeing Sirius being tortured by Voldemort. He starts to realize that he has this connection to Voldemort that he never knew about. And that's another thing, like him being able to speak Parseltongue. He has certain things about him that starts to make him wonder, is he going to become more like Voldemort? Since everything that's happened, he feels like he's starting to snap and become evil, just like Voldemort, that he's destined to be that way. Which leads to a certain set of scenes where Snape teaches him how to discipline his mind and control his emotions. Otherwise, Voldemort's going to get his hands right where he wants them. Look, I know I've indulged in Snape a lot in these videos, but I can't help it, so let's just go with it. You went black, you're two of a kind, sentimental children forever whining about how bitterly unfair your lives have been. Well, it may have escaped your notice, 
but life isn't fair. But it's in this scene here, where after insulting Harry's dad, Harry finally has had enough, and he uses that spell that Snape has been using right against him, and he gets inside Snape's head, and you learn why he hated Harry's father, James. Because James was kind of like Draco Malfoy, and how he basically humiliated him in front of almost the whole school. And I remember watching this on opening day. I was stunned by this information. I hadn't read the books all the way through, as I've said in other videos, but this was pretty surprising, and you actually understand why Snape is the way he is, and why he hates Harry, and... Harry's dad, James. And there's another great scene that I really like since I mentioned Harry feeling like he's becoming more like Voldemort. In another conversation with Sirius, Sirius tells him, look, Harry, you're not a bad person. You're a good person who bad things have happened to. We've all got light and dark inside of us. What matters the most, though, is the part that we choose to act on. And it's another example of why this series has resonated with a lot of people because it relates to real things that we experience as human beings. We've all got a good side. We've all got a dark side. Whatever part we choose to to act on, that's really all that matters. As Rachel said in Batman Begins, it's what you do that defines you. Unfortunately, Dumbledore's army is caught by Professor Umbridge and is forced to be dismantled after Cho Chang, who Harry shared his first kiss with, is forced to reveal what's been going on after she was tortured by Professor Umbridge with some kind of a potion. Again, evil bitch. Sorry. And Harry and Hermione have had enough of this, and they decide to trick Professor Umbridge into going into this forest area, just nearby Hagrid's hut, where Hagrid's half-brother, Groppy, right? Yeah, grabs her, and all these other centaurs come in and take her away. And it's basically a giant, yes, got what you deserved. Oh, and just to go back to the humor real quick, it just popped into my head. When Dumbledore's about to be arrested by the Ministry, there's this one character, I don't know his name. I love what he says right here. Dumbledore's got style. And after experiencing this vision of Sirius being tortured by Voldemort, Harry decides to go to where he believes that he saw it, along with some others like Ginny, Luna, Neville, and Ron and Hermione, to find Sirius and see what exactly is Voldemort after. And upon investigating this room, Harry discovers this crystal ball containing a prophecy, for one must kill the other, neither can live while the other survives, realizing that either he or Voldemort are going to have to kill each other somehow, or one's going to have to kill the other in the end. And right there, they're confronted by Draco's father, Lucius, and Bellatrix Lestrange, and an all-out war breaks out in this hall. And it is pretty awesome. And David Yates, with his direction, does a great job with these action sequences. They are exciting, they're enthralling, and yeah, all the above. And one of my favorite lines from Sirius. Get away from my gut, son. But unfortunately, during this battle, Sirius is killed by Bellatrix. And watching this movie again last night, I almost teared up. And chills were running all throughout my body seeing Harry's response to this and his scream. Oh, man. And then he chases after Bellatrix and he is ready to perform the Cruciatus Curse, but then Voldemort appears, trying to tempt him into killing her. But then Harry resists and Dumbledore shows up, and this battle between him and Voldemort, it's awesome. I love this battle between the two. It doesn't last very long, but it's really exciting. And this encounter between the two, it actually reminded me of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader meeting up in A New Hope. A former student and former mentor meeting up after so many years. The battle is actually really really intense, on an emotional level anyway. And I don't know if it was intentional on J.K. Rowling's part as far as the story goes, but I noticed some Star Wars parallels in here. I'll mention those in a little bit. After this battle ensues, Voldemort decides to seep into Harry's soul and try to control him. And it's this psychological battle that keeps going back and forth where Voldemort tries to use Harry's memories against him, but with the help of Dumbledore, Harry says that you're the weak one. You're not gonna know love and friendship, and I feel sorry for you. It's exactly why we love you, Harry, once again. And right after that happens, Fudge and the Aurors show up, and Fudge finally admits that Voldemort's back. Dumbledore's reinstated, Umbridge is fired, Fudge resigns, a whole bunch of reshaping takes place, and there's this conversation between Harry and Dumbledore, where Dumbledore finally admits that he was wrong to stay away from Harry all this time. Harry feels a little bit let down by the fact that he didn't tell him about the prophecy, and Dumbledore says, after all that's happened to you, I didn't want to cause you any more pain. Since I mentioned the Star Wars parallels, it's kind of like Luke and Obi-Wan in Return of the Jedi, where Luke says, Why didn't you tell me about my father? You told me Darth Vader killed him. And Obi-Wan's response is kind of like, 
I didn't know if you were ready to face the truth yet. You had all that weight on your shoulders. I feel like that would have made it worse for you. I see Dumbledore as kind of like the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the Harry Potter franchise, and like I said before, Harry's kind of like Luke Skywalker in some ways. Like Goblet of Fire, this movie ends on a very somber or sad, but yet somewhat hopeful note for what's to come. And... They did it again. Order of the Phoenix is a really great movie and probably my second favorite as of right now behind Prisoner of Azkaban. For a while, I considered it to be one of my least favorites, but watching it again, that's not the case anymore. I actually love this movie. Those are my thoughts on The Order of the Phoenix. Thank you guys for watching. Tell me what you think of this movie down below. Do you like it? You hate it? You think it's all right? Whatever your thoughts are, just comment below and tell me. Stay tuned for my review of The Half-Blood Prince coming up soon. And thank you guys for sticking around after all this stuff has been going on in my personal life or whatever. I don't want to be too specific, but if you follow my social media pages, you probably know what that is. Nonetheless, thank you guys for sticking around. I look forward to putting out more videos for you guys, and I will see you all very soon. And, by the way, happy Thanksgiving, everybody.